Hi, I'm Eric, and I'm a social studies educator, historian, and host of this, the Everything is a Primary Source podcast. I'm also an avid collector of popular culture artifacts. I love what I find at thrift store outlets, garage sale leftovers, and what I spot just making my way around the built world. I enjoy sorting through boxes of free books and magazines, not to mention online collections like Internet Archive and, of course, the Library of Congress. But you don't need to spend your time digging through bins or following online rabbit holes to get a look into the past. The movies and TV we watch, the books we read, and the games we play are all documents of the past. So is fashion, food, music, toys, even the roads we travel on and the places we live and work in. Everything is a primary source. This podcast is the result of exhibiting these kinds of artifacts in public, getting passers-by to select an item they connect with, and then chatting with me to see what it says about the time, place, and people who made it. The conversation you are about to hear, therefore, is your history, my history, our history, through popular culture. at Free Comic Book Day in Rochester, New Hampshire, and this is the last of the citywide Free Comic Book Days. Have you been involved in these before? This is my first one, so I'm kind of sad it's going to be the last one, too. <laughs> of this size. They, they, yeah. The people at Jetpack Comics who organize this keep uh, telling me, they're like, well, it's we're going to keep doing it because it's a national thing. It's yeah. not just, but we just need to scale it down a bit. It's getting a little bit difficult to manage all the time and yeah. you know, they devote a lot of money and energy into it so it's understandable but it'd be kind of too bad um, yeah. because it does bring the community together pretty well and Absolutely. You know, it's a big attraction uh, so from my table of pop culture stuff uh, you chose um, a pair of things so we have Charlotte's Web by E.B. White yep and the copy of it, I'm not exactly sure when it came out, but it's, I'd say, relatively recent. Um, the book itself, I want to say 50s? Does that sound right? 50s or 60s? Maybe I even earlier. I would say, probably like I'm, 60s. I'm sure it's somewhere yeah. in there. Let's um, see if I can find it. <laughs> and the other thing that you spotted, which is right next to it, is a VHS tape of a short film made about Beverly Cleary's The Mouse and the Motorcycle. Correct. And I would say that both of these share in a couple of things. Um, one, animals that take on human traits and abilities, uh, more so in The Mouse and the Motorcycle. Charlotte's Web, they can talk to each other, but right. in Mouse and the Motorcycle, he actually rides a motorcycle around, uh, which almost adds like a sci-fi element to both of these, or at least fantasy. But um, I think that actually goes right into who is the intended audience of that. Yeah. Who were these books written for? I want to say kids, and the reason I say that is because I was in second grade when both of those were read to me as a kid and actually developed my love of reading from them because you could just almost see it, the animals talking to yeah. each other and envision that. And I just absolutely loved Charlotte. I mean, the, the spider, the yeah. web thing, that was so cool. Well, and it's, that book in particular, between the two, I think has a lot more philosophy and wisdom that they give out. And it's, it's showing that even in the barnyard, the most forgettable creature, yep. a spider up in the corner, of, you know, there's, you go to any barn in the country and in the summertime, there's countless spider webs everywhere that, they're bestowing this this brilliant way of seeing life and it, it's showing that yeah even animals have these perspectives on us we not we might not realize it but they they do and yeah. so did the having this book read to you um, at such a young age inform the way that you see animals in, in your life or? oh yeah oh yeah I am an animal lover but I am the type of person, I know, I mean, just like people, they have feelings, they have... So even, this, you know, a significant little spider, look how much of a difference. I know it's a story, but look how much of a difference in the story. That's yeah. that's awesome symbolism. 1952. Ah, I saw that. <laughs> and so it's, uh, 
It's in that post-World War II era in which we see coming in all shapes and forms um, values, ideas, um, mostly very American-based cultural mores and what's considered to be good because, you know, early Cold War, post-World War II, we were victorious in World War II, we're now going up against a new threat, and that is communism and Soviet Union. Uh, this, I think, is a lot less, it's a lot more toned down than some of the other right. Cold War era, you know, almost like propaganda types of things. It's not propaganda, it's, it's a children's story. But <coughs> what emotions do you, me- do you remember having as your teacher read Charlotte's Web to you? I remember being completely fascinated by it. I always wanted to, <laughs> it sounds silly, because I was so little, um, but I used to look in webs. What if it could happen? What if something like that could happen yeah. with animals? I mean, why couldn't it? Right. It, maybe there's a whole world around us that we're, or there is a world that we're not seeing. Yeah. And, and that plays so well into a kid's imagination, yep. you know, of creating, it, it's almost, um, Tapping into like transcendentalism a little bit of you know, the natural world or the animal world being able to share with us lessons that if we just pay enough attention to it, we can get something out of it. Which, right. Again, E.B. White, I think he's an old New Englander, right? He's a scholar, he's a super smart guy, he's not, um, you know, he, he's, and he wrote Stuart Little, which I think has some similarities to the mouse and the motorcycle you it know does, giving yeah. the smallest animal such a big impact on world life. right yep. and, and stuff you know around them um now this one which also feeds into its uh intended audience is by eb white author of Stuart little so he wrote that before and that's part of the hand-drawn cover art Pictures by Garth Williams. Now, Garth Williams is a well-known, and this is a Newbery Honor book, but that's for the the content, not for the... The Caldecott goes to uh, illustrations. So it's not a... It's not every page. Yep. But enough wonderful illustrations, just pen and ink, beautiful pictures of, you know, every couple pages. When this story is being read to you, did your teacher show the pictures to you, do you recall, or did they just read from the book itself? Most likely they did, but when I read or somebody's reading to me, I have this ability to get lost in the story, so I'm already envisioning it in my head, so I probably didn't even pay attention to the pictures. I, I was going to say, because they're drawn in such a way that you get hints of what they're meant to look like. It's right. not as clear-cut as... You know, a, a, a picture book. It's not a picture book. If it was a picture book, full color images, or at least right. far more detailed images, where you have no choice but to picture the characters the way that the artist wants you to. Right. Here, it's, you know, just kind of like your own imagination. And if you looked at the pictures, you're like, okay, it's a slight, slight right. kind of hint at what you should be thinking, but it's not. I can still see it in my head, the rat. I don't remember what his Templeton, name was. Templeton, yeah. yes. I can still see him with that rotten egg in my head. <laughs> yep, and, and scurrying away with it. And, yep. And when you, have you seen any of the movie versions of this? Because in the 60s, they made an animated one, and then in the early 2000s, I they had a I believe I saw one of the Charlotte Webbs. It was the newer of the two. Still, it did not go with what my head had. <laughs> did that bother you at all? Did you? No, okay. no. Okay, so you weren't like, like... I wasn't frustrated, no. I just, I prefer the book because yeah. it, no matter it, what I read, I can get lost. And I think that's such a, that right there, especially for the audience it's made for, young kids, yep. when they're still, you know, it's usually like second, third grade that they get introduced to the story Yep. because it's a great transition from picture book to chapter books. Yeah. That it gives them that ability to be like, you still have an imagination. You still have that ability to conjure up your own images. Um, but you're also listening to a, a deeper story than just see Jane run. You yep. know? 
run, Jane, run. You know, that, it's like that. There's there's more to it than that. There's it's a deeper undertone. Now moving over to Beverly Cleary and the mouse and the motorcycle. Um, I brought in the VHS of it, but she had probably an even larger list of young kid stories than E.B. White right. has under his belt. Um, did you, were you introduced to her stories in a similar way? It, yeah. I think it was the same teacher, too. I really do. I wish I remember her name, because that was just, it was amazing. It just, I don't know what clicked, but I've always been a strong reader ever since. Mm -hmm. Just some about those two stories. Now, Beverly Cleary's stories, you know, she's the Ramona. Oh, yes, uh, I've read most of those. <laughs> Henry Huggins, like, and this one kind of stands out from those because it deals with something pretty fantastic, which is a mouse that can learn to drive a motorcycle around, <laughs> um, which most of her books are just kind of like slice of life, you know, here's right. this, you know, energetic kid Ramona and her sister Beezus, and they just kind of go through, uh, you know, everyday suburban middle class, you know, existence. It's really right. not anything wild and, and crazy like this. Um, the cover art, I feel like Charlotte's Web has always stayed pretty much the same. Yep. Because it has those illustrations. The Ramona books and the Mouse and the Motorcycle also have similar illustrations within the books as well. Um, we were just reading to my son uh, Tales of a Fourth Grade Nothing, which is the Judy Bloom uh, yeah. fudge series, you know, Super Fudge and all those. Uh, and they also, it's they're right there with Beverly and Clear. I used to confuse the two all the time when Did I was you? a kid because my, my teacher, even if she wasn't reading them to it, like the books were always like kind of together on the shelves yep. and very similar cover art. I feel like teachers in the period following these books publications just had all of these to pull from. And even though the cover art might change, the stories within them remain the exact same. Absolutely. And what does that tell you? Uh, and that the audience doesn't ever change either. Um, what does it tell you about these kinds of stories geared towards that specific age group? What, what does it say about that age it's, group? That age group. I mean, we had, I mean, especially when I was younger, because we didn't have a lot of the toys and stuff that the kids have now, is your imagination is what kept you going during the day. You I mean, you went outside to play and it wasn't just, you weren't just outside, you were imagining things around you mm -hmm. and the world was so much different. Um, these stories stand the test of time because it's values, it's, and just the way they're written. I mean, the imagination that springs forth. I mean, they're still innocent at that age yeah. and they can still visualize all that stuff. Did you make your own stories? Uh, at that age or beyond? Um... I actually did. I was a little uh, creepy. We had, <laughs> we had a little cemetery in the middle of the woods because I lived in the middle of nowhere. Mm. And uh, I used to go in there and I'd, I'd break down the names on the stones. And then I would create stories about these kids. I was probably about 10 years old. That's not creepy. That's brilliant, actually. It's like yeah. a... It was a lot of fun. Do you feel that having these stories read to you or reading them yourself may have planted the seed for that kind of... I mean, it's a possibility. I was just... I was always out in the woods. I was always outside. And I'd build forts and, you yeah. know, make-believe was my life. That's what I did. And I suppose there's no reason you shouldn't do this or couldn't do this. You could write that. That right there, what you just told me, mm -hmm. sounds like the plot line of any one of these books. Absolutely. You know, a... Uh, a little girl, Crystal, right? <laughs> who, as you know, I, I can kind of envision you could go a mystery route of it, right? Yeah. There, there is actually a story at, uh, called Wait Till Helen Comes. Do you remember that one? Um, no, I don't remember that one. Late 70s, I want to say. Uh, and it was, I think, geared towards slightly older, maybe like fourth to sixth grade reading level. My wife is a school librarian, and she is... That's like her one of her favorite books. Wait till Helen comes. Yeah. And um, it deals with a mystery of a ghost girl that keeps showing up and saying things like "Wait till Helen comes," and then she is investigating a cemetery yeah. that you know is and doing similar to what you're coming like kind of like imagining you know who's this 
grave marker to and, and things like that. So it's like all these stories, the a spider in a barnyard, the mouse that scurries into its hole, you know, before you can... Yeah. They inspire with the right imagination. Yep. And so we need to keep that going. We you, absolutely you know, do. You're absolutely right. We didn't have... You know, when I was a kid, we had video games. They weren't... They were a basic Atari. Right. They weren't yeah. enough to keep us, like, inside for hours. And, yeah, yeah we would imme- immediately find our way out. So it's like these came at the right time and offered that initial inspiration to then become creative ourselves and then pass that down right. in our own ways later on. So um, thanks so much for, for stopping by and, and doing this. And uh, I look forward to... Um, I look forward to working with you again in the future. All right, sounds good. Thank you so much. every year forward. Well, unfortunately, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but this is the last time it's going to be on this scale. So Rochester, New Hampshire has been benefiting for well over 10 years now from Jetpack Comics doing a citywide event, but this is, they announced earlier this year, they said 2024 will be our last time that we do it this big. I guess it's just getting a little bit too hectic for them to, to keep up with. So, there, there is a lot of people. Yeah, it's uh, it's a big undertaking on their part. But but if they're still still doing some sort of yeah, celebration, I'll come back. They, and they always, they do a great job of just their store alone is enough to... Yeah, they're awesome down there. ...to enjoy. So you selected from my table. Um, this will be the second time today we're talking about Charlotte's Web. Um, yes. The story Charlotte's Web by E.B. White came out, published 1952. And uh, the question I selected to go along with it is uh, where was it made and or what locations are associated with it? And um, E.B. White, to my knowledge, is fairly, well, he passed away, but fairly local. Uh, So we're here in New England and uh, it was, I don't know if they say it in the book exactly, but there are four seasons throughout Charlotte's Web, aren't there? Uh Yeah. So we assume it must be somewhere in the northeast or somewhere in the north where yeah. there's a farm and there's all this thing. Somewhere temperate. Yeah. So um, what does that tell you about that story and the time period that it came out in that they made sure to, to put it somewhere that has a four-season cycle to it because I, I feel like that's part of the story isn't it oh uh, yeah i feel i feel like it um i don't remember a lot of details last time i read it was in school but if i it, usually in stories seasons help like pace it a yeah. lot they help like oh this is one chunk of the story this is in spring and then the next part happens in summer and it's a it's a really great pacing tool in, in literature it's and it, especially with a story about a barnyard. Yeah. And the the lifespan of a spider is pretty short. Yeah. It's less than a year, so. A surprisingly depressing kid story. I know. Well, you know, and that's it's what we were talking about before is that it is definitely geared towards kids. <laughs> um, it, it is definitely geared towards children, but it doesn't have, you know, it's. I mean, it has its goofiness to it. It has definitely oh, kids' yeah. scenes in it, but it's still a kind of a serious subject. It's a kind of book that everyone can enjoy. Right, and it, it, I think it stays with people, and it obviously stays with yeah. you. That's why you definitely. picked it up right away. With the, so the the climax of the story is when they end up at the fair, and yes. you know, um, Wilbur is not selected because he's a tremendous sized pig but because he has this spider along with him that makes him into this public you know, publicity thing where everybody yeah. wants to see this amazing pig that has a spider that writes out words in it yeah. um, throughout it. And my understanding is that the Freiburg Fair, 
which is up in Maine, um, is the is understood to be that's what the fair in the book is is the Fryberry. They don't call it that, but um, it's implied. Yeah. So, uh, have you gone? Because right here in Rochester, there's the Rochester Fair. Uh, have you ever been to those fairs? I, I remember vaguely going to the Rochester Fair when I was like younger. Yeah. And. Um, uh, I haven't been to, like, any fair in Maine. I mean, I was at the Ren Fair once, but that was, like, not the same thing. Right, but in a way it is, because, I mean, the 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 the, the concept of a fair, yeah. even an agricultural fair, does date back pretty well into medieval Europe, right? Yeah, Where, that makes sense. Yeah, people would bring in whatever, and kind of what we're doing right now. Yeah, like a big every, old plaza to look at a bunch of different stuff from all sorts of different people. Yeah, and when people get tired of that, go and play a game or have some kind of, you know, uh, refreshment going on. Yeah. So, you know, what the fair that's in Charlotte's Web is actually an extension, not just of, like, 19th century America. It's, like, 12th century Europe, yeah. you know, if you want it's to date a whole, It's a whole series of history. And, and do you think that that also, you know, because the, the main locations associated throughout Charlotte's Web is you have Fern's farm, her uncle's farm, where most of the action takes place is because, you know, they're going to kill the pig at the beginning. Uh, and yeah. then she saves it and it goes off to her uncle's farm where it keeps getting spared, you know, time spared, you know, over spared, and over again. Spared. And then they go beyond that to the fair and then they come back to the farm. So there's like three different places on it. The fair is in that last act of the book. Do you feel that, given the time of the year that most of these fairs take place, which is the fall, yeah. uh, early to, to mid-fall, do you think that that has, you, you mentioned before about pacing of the story, yeah. do you think that it has a role in it too? Uh, yeah, it's like this big, it's the big event that kind of like the, I don't know I don't remember if it's been mentioned in like was it mentioned earlier in the story at all? Uh, as far as like, the, the, like, like they, they plant the seed like early on and be like oh we're going to bring this to the fair I don't think so I think it's just kind of implied that that's what rural mm -hmm. people do yeah well, that if you live in a farm yeah, area that's what with the whole rural context it's like even if you don't know about it like ahead of time it's the whole it's like a big thing that coincides with the climax of the story. Yeah. It makes it even more exciting. It's like for that demographic, that is their year. Yeah, kind of, it's like the climax of the year. Yeah, is the fair. Yeah. Whereas somebody in a big city or even in a suburban setting wouldn't be, you know, they might go to a, a, a agricultural fair as a way to get a taste of the countryside, yeah. they're not necessarily going because it's the centerpiece of their year. They have yeah. that kind of stuff on hand all year round. They don't need to wait until October. Yeah, grocery stores and stuff. Right. You just, <laughs> they don't need to, you know, and they're, they're not too concerned about the biggest pig or the, uh, you know, a, a cow milking contest. I don't know if they have those uh, or not, yeah. but, you know, it's, so it's like that in 1950s America, um, to your knowledge, what was the, was there a changing landscape that E.B. White may have tried to preserve urban or rural culture in like a, a time capsule almost in Charlotte's Way? It seems kind of like that, yeah. Like, what was happening? In, in look the, through this and see that snapshot of time. Yeah. Have you seen any of the movie versions of Charlotte's Web? I must have seen it like once in school, but not not in my like adulthood. Because they, they have like there's the animated one I think it was like 1970. Uh, I I think. Uh, and then there was one with Dakota Fanning as Fern that came out probably 2006. Is that the live action one? Yeah. Yeah, I've definitely seen that. I just don't remember much. Because well, that one seems to be hard to place as far as what time period it's meant to be. Yeah. Because. It's Kind of like a mix of all sorts of different stuff. Yeah, it kind of reminds me of like the 1989 Batman, where it's yeah. like some of the cars look like they're from the 40s, but then 
their language and their fashion yeah. is from the modern day. It's like it's like when you see some sort of sci-fi and then they're like they have old muskets. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Almost like a steampunk kind of thing. Yeah. Imagine steampunk Charlotte's Web. That'd be fun, right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, like a top hat and pig wearing goggles. Right. <laughs> <laughs> we we may have be onto something. We should do that. Yeah. Um, so I, I think that the reason I went with that motif in 2000, whatever year it was that it came out, was to preserve in place that... Because if you go to the agricultural fairs now... Yeah. I mean, it is, yeah, a little bit different from the rest of society, but you can see people listening to music. It's definitely, phones, like, more they, of outside society is seeped in, definitely. Yeah, yeah, that's a good way of putting it. It does it. that over time. It's like a bleeding Sharpie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think that's going to be the title of this episode, is The yeah. Bleeding Sharpie. <laughs> you, you put it so well, and I think that you just proved exactly what we do here, and that is to dissect and to figure out, um, in this case, how Charlotte's Web, just the locations that they associate with it, is very emblematic of the time. Yes. The 1950s, I mean, that came out 52, so uh, it's post-World War II. Uh, growth of the suburbs. Yeah, I, and I feel like the live action, not only, like, it takes a bit from the you know older setting but it also like still finds ways to connect to the now the audience that was like now a day around then yeah so that's probably why it has a whole sort of mix of stuff so it it calls back to the original book but it also piques the interest of the younger people yeah because they were they inserted i would say all the 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 huge um you know, the scope of the actors and actresses that provided their voices in Charlotte's Web. You had Julia Roberts as Charlotte. Yeah. You had uh, Andre 3000 as one of the crows, which are not characters in the book. So they're, like, inserting as much yeah. of the spectrum of... of as much uh, of the pop culture of the time as they can. Yeah, so that they could get grandparents... Because by that point, grandparents yeah. had grown up with the book. Yeah, the grandparents can sit down and watch it with their kids, still get a taste of the old book while the kids sit there and enjoy the pop culture references, I guess. I think we just put the stamp on this book. We said, we got you. We understand <laughs> it perfectly. And I really appreciate you taking the time to do this. Of course. That was a lot of fun. I give you permission to use this on the internet. <laughs> Popular culture, by definition, connects and unites us, and proves that people of different backgrounds, in fact, have a lot in common with one another. I hope you enjoyed this conversation, at least in part, for that reason. If it connects with you and you'd like to add to it, or any of the podcast episodes, just visit everything-history.com and search for the Everything is a Primary Source project, which can be found in the classroom section of the website. We'd love to hear what you have to say. Be sure to rate and share this podcast wherever you are listening to it now, and follow Everything as a Primary Source on social media, including YouTube and especially Instagram. Thank you for listening to the EPS Podcast, where everything is a primary source.